It's good to have Brother Ralph Sexton, Dr. Ralph Sexton from Asheville, North Carolina. You know what I admire about him? It makes no difference what level or who it is. He always takes time, and he'll speak to folks, and he cares for people. And it's just, I'll take that in a minute, brother. I know you've got a bad back. But I say, I notice that. I don't care who it is. He just loves people. And he's been a blessing to our church. He's helped our church. He's helped my life. He's been a blessing to me and my family. And it's an honor to have Dr. Ralph Sexton. Thank I'm turning this over. We, we recognize you tonight, Pastor, in Pond Fork. Uh, you guys were a vital part of what we just did in memory of Musette and raising money for the ambulance. And this was our third piece of equipment. This was the one that you helped in the first time. This is the medical motorcycle. It gets through the traffic, has the crash cart on the back, and here's a model of that one, and that's uh, in Natanya. And then the white ambulance that we bought uh, two years ago it's in Jerusalem, and then here's the brand new one, and you'll notice it's a different color. It's yellow, and that means that it's an intensive care unit. It can do blood transfusions, minor surgeries uh, in the field, and this one is on a, a container right now, left Baltimore. It's headed to the Holy Land, and when we get there in October, uh, we'll present it to the Israeli government up at the top of uh, the mountain there where the Knesset is. And then here's the brand new underground blood center. Uh, it's my privilege to have dinner with Benny Mar Marcus uh, a few days ago. And uh, he wrote a check there at that dinner for uh, $24 million wow. to, to make a little gift to get started on this project. I told him you'd probably match it when I saw you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And... Uh, <laughs> And then here's a picture they just uncovered there of, of Calvary. Here's the, the skull from 1900. So I got you and Brother Ron a copy of that. Let's give him a big hand. Oh, Pond Fork, thank you. Thank you so much. That's a blessing. Amen. You couldn't do what we do without all these churches pitching together and helping. And I thank you for that. And uh, you can be seated. And uh, thank you for coming out tonight. And ladies, there's some beautiful cashmere scarves out there on the table and some other things that came in Friday from Israel. And they're for a donation. 63 Christian families live out of one gift shop in Bethlehem. Bethlehem used to be 87% Christian. It's now, uh, depending on who you read after, 9% or 12%. Muslims have pushed the Christians out. 63 families live out of one shop. So periodically during the year, they send me a little box of, of things uh, that we can sell, and then we send the money to them, and then they divide it up, okay? And so these are beautiful cashmere scarves. They're different colors, ladies. And uh, uh, it says here they're made in Jerusalem, and uh, they're for a donation. There's some envelopes out there. It's got a, the Red Star David on it some olive wood pieces, uh, some Jerusalem handbags. That doesn't go to RSM. Uh, that's uh, separate. It goes to the Israel Fund. So, but uh, that's how we do the ambulances, the medical motorcycle. And you say, why do you do that? The Bible says in Genesis that if we would bless Israel, that he would bless us. And... Uh, in case you haven't noticed in the news, why are there people in the United States Congress that hates the nation of Israel? Why, there's no reason for that. Why would you do that? That's our biggest ally in the Middle East. And the reason is there's two nations in the world that are built on the Word of God. One of them was 1776, the United States of America. Why well, we even quote the Bible on our Liberty Bell. We got the Scripture. Our founding fathers had enough sense that they carved it in stone. And I'm grateful with the fake news today that you wouldn't know that we're a Christian nation, but you can get the bus, a train, a plane, and go to Washington. It's carved in stone. Our founding fathers were men and women of faith. And uh, 
We've got it on our currency. God bless America. And uh, that's our motto. That didn't happen by accident. That was paid for in blood. And if we want to see revival in America, we've got to get back to our founding father's faith. And so I hope that you will uh, remember that America was founded on that principle May 14, 1948. We had another nation form. It was a nation of Israel. And they took uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and they made that their constitution. What about that? Said, we're going to build our, our whole country on the Word of God. They didn't have a flag. They said, what are we going to do? That afternoon, when Harry Truman called, and uh, it was the first nation to congratulate him for being a nation, the United States president, and he called and congratulated him, and they took one of the man's, uh, one of the Orthodox Jews' prayer shawl, laid it on the table there where they were meeting, and took some blue paint and paint, painted the Star of David. It used to be on David's battle shield, and they put it on that prayer shawl and ran it up on the flagpole and said, that'll be our flag to this day. To this day, that flag flies over the nation of Israel, and every time the wind blows it, it's a prayer to a holy God, Jehovah, that he said, I knew you before I made worlds. I loved you. I provided for you, and I will take care of you. He's not going to change his mind. And, and so we're a part of seeing the blessing and the prophecy of God fulfilled. If you had stood with God in the dateless past and asked God, to let you pick when you wanted to be alive on planet Earth, you could not have picked a more exciting time to be on this Earth than right now, tonight, because you're seeing the prophecies of the Word of God fulfilled. And uh, we just had the news report. I don't know if you saw it last fall, but we had a red uh, calf born in Israel, and it's the first one in 2,000 years. First one in 2,000 years that passed the muster. We had one uh, uh, three or four years ago, but before the first year was up, those rabbis take a magnifying glass. They start at the nose and they go to the tail. They find one white hair, one black hair. It's disqualified. And this uh, little animal uh, is already uh, 14 months old, and uh, it not only has... Uh, red hair from the nose to the tail. They said that she's so red that their hooves are red. Said they're tinted red. And they think that that's the first one. And they need one red heifer uh, that they will kill that has reached the year, two years of age. And then they'll be able to purify the priesthood. What does that mean? It means Israel's planning to start uh, building the temple again because they believe that the Messiah is coming. They're more excited than we're excited. They're more preparing more than we're preparing. Can you imagine that? They believe at any moment that the Messiah could come. And so you're alive to see all these prophecies coming together. And then what about last Friday? Uh, the whole, uh, on the news in France, the news in England, Germany, United States, uh, South Africa, they said foxes are on the Temple Mount. Foxes are on the Temple Mount. You say, what in the world does that mean? But there's a prophecy in the Old Testament, Lamentation, talks about right before the Messiah comes that they'll, uh, Jerusalem will be desolate with the pressures of the world and the sign to the world that the Messiah's coming. Foxes will play on the Temple Mount. And boy, they got them photographed right there Friday. Goosebump City. I'm telling you what. That the Lord's coming, and he Amen. could come today. And you're alive to see all of this happen. I mean, we're, we're here. We're seeing it. Now, last night uh, when I was over with our friends at Calvary, I talked about the burden to pray, and that if the devil can, he'll get you bogged down in guilt of sins you've already confessed and are already under the blood. And so... Uh, I quoted a, a phrase from the uh, song, Rock of Ages Cleft for Me. It says, of sin, the double cure. And what is that double cure? That's salvation of your soul, forgiveness of sin. And then 
taken away the guilt. You say, is that really in the Bible? Why, yeah. There is now, therefore, no guilt, no condemnation to them that believe. God said, I'll not only save you, but I'll take away. Uh, a lot of times you'll get down to pray, and God will remind you what you did 20 years ago. You'll try to, to sing in the choir, teach a Sunday school class. The devil will say, you're not worthy. Why, you remember what you did that night when you were at the nightclub? You remember that night you used drugs? Remember that night you got drunk and wrecked your car? And we remember it, but God doesn't remember it. See, he chose not to remember it, and therefore you can not only be forgiven, but the guilt can be taken away. And that's the step to revival. I believe that the church is in such a weakened state that we're going to have to go back to the basics. In the kindergarten, we used to take the wooden blocks and we'd teach the kids to make uh, letters into words. C-A-T. And you had to find them, make a word. D-O-G, make a word. And they were building blocks of education. And we've become so immature spiritually in the house of God, we've traded off our old-time religion for showtime religion and we turn church into religious entertainment rather than the presence and the power of God. And what we desperately need is to get back to those building blocks of our faith. We don't teach our children the catechisms of what they believe. Why do you believe it? Uh, apologetics. It doesn't mean you apologize, but it means that you are able to defend what you believe. If someone asks you about uh, is there a trinity in the word of God would you know uh, to say yes there is then you, they say well you got three gods I say no I got one God but he manifests himself in three distinct personalities how do I handle that I go to John chapter 3 I've got John the Baptist there at Beth Abra. for those of you that have traveled with us to the Holy Land that's the authentic site that's where Elisha and Elijah crossed over. That's where they smote with the prayer shawl and parted the waters of the Jordan. This is the location where the children of Israel came out of the wilderness, came into the promised land. God chose that place for his son to be baptized. It was the birth of Israel into the promised land. It was the power and the demonstration to the prophets and the preachers of God's word and when it was time to baptize this boy, he said, I want you right here at this intersection at Beth Abra. And there's John the Baptist. He grew up helping his daddy. Luke 2, what did his daddy do? In Luke 1 and Luke 2, we know that John helped his father, in, who was in the order there of taking care of the royal sheep. And the royal sheep are the sheep that are going to be pure and without spot and, and mark. So they can go to the Temple Mount and be offered. And John held on to his daddy's coat. Little old toddler walked out in shepherd's field with him. And he'd hear his daddy say, Oh, John, look at this one. It's pure. There's no mark. There's no blemish. Let's set him aside. Wipe him off and clean him. Said he's worthy of the holy God of Israel. We'll present him a sacrifice. And they'll go around and there'd be another one born. You say that many? There was thousands of them. Remember, all those sheep had to be born somewhere in the nearest sheep field to the temple is Bethlehem's shepherd's field. And, and that location, that place, that site, uh, then John the Baptist grew up there with his daddy, Zacharias. And Zacharias' responsibility was to have the sheep that go to the temple mount. And watch what happens. John is there, and he's watching and listening to his daddy grade sheep. And he'd say, that lamb's for God. That lamb's for God. And just a few years later, he's down at Beth Abra in obedience to the God of this universe, and he's got the, the, the folks down there being baptized, and he looks up, and all of a sudden he sees another lamb. He says, behold! The Lamb of God. And boy, Jesus walks down there and he baptized the Son of God. 
You know how he could do that? He had been grading sheep his whole life. He, he knew a lamb when he saw one, and that was God's one holy lamb. And that's that Bethabara. And so you're, you're living, seeing all of this happening right now on your watch. Can you believe it? We've got to go back to the basics of knowing what we believe. So John has got Jesus in his arms, right? And then when he comes up, a voice from heaven, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, right? And then the, the dove, a type of the Holy Spirit, comes across, and you've got the Holy Spirit, God the Father, God the Son, right there in those two verses. And you've got the proof of the Trinity right there. And you say, well, that's impossible. Well, think about what you can do with a molecule of water. You can freeze it, you can boil it, make a gas, and you can condense it, make it back to a liquid. It's still H2O, but you got a solid liquid gas. And what about what you did for breakfast this morning? You messed up. You ordered a Trinity for breakfast, a shell, a white, and a yolk. You just named it an egg. It is a Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. You've called it an egg, see? It's a, a trinity all wrapped up into one. Three distinct personalities, right? Isn't it amazing? Uh, it, 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 it's good, but uh, each one of them can have a useful purpose, but it's a lot better when that shell keeps it insulated, sealed with the Holy Spirit promise of the day of redemption. And then you see the living body of Christ and then the yoke of the power of God all brought together. Everything God made has a message in it for the truth and the hour that we're living in. So tonight, as we talked about the power of prayer last night, that we not let guilt rob us from our prayer life, tonight I want to talk to you about your Bible, the inerrant, infallible, holy, inspired Word of God. The text that we have tonight will be in 2 Timothy, and you can know that this is the Word of God. This book is amazing. Your Bible, it's in your hand. All of us have Bibles. We own Bibles. Some of us have more than one because uh, we like to have different study notes, and we like uh, Thompson Chain, Reference Bible, and C.I. Schofield, and J. Phineas Dake. And uh, we know that there's all kinds of commentators and all kinds of people that have worked on the Word of God. But I'm talking about the body of Christ that's built together the Word. I'm not talking about the, the men that have made commentaries. I'm talking about the text, the Scripture. Now, uh, when you hold your Bible in your hand, you're holding 66 books of the Bible. Now, here's how you begin to tie the knots together and make a chain that you can understand. This book, this Bible, was written over 1,500 years. 66 books over 1,500 years. Now, uh, here's the fascinating part. 40 different secretaries wrote down what God dictated. Now, I didn't use the word author, did I? I used secretaries. And you know why I did that? Is because we know that beyond any shadow of a doubt that God is the author of his word. Thank you, brother. And we know that these 40 men had heard from God and God had given them the inspiration and they wrote it down. So I like to refer to them as secretaries and that God inspired the word and that you don't have to be afraid to trust the Bible as the Word of God. Now, uh, over a period uh, of 1,500 years, we had the Scripture uh, given to us, and it was written down. Look what it says in 2 Timothy chapter 3. And for the sake of time, let's go down to verse 14. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast, what, learned them, and that from a child, from a child, thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. 
All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now, when I pick up my Bible, I've got these 66 books. I have 40 different secretaries. And you've got to remember, if this is the timeline, and I'm down here in Genesis, and I go all the way up through the Word of God, and I come up here to Acts 2, that's 2,000 years. From Acts 2 to Revelation, uh, we know that if I go from Genesis chapter 1 to Genesis 12, I got 2,000 years. Genesis 12, Acts 2, I got 2,000 years. Acts 2 to Revelation, I got 2,000 years. Well, out of that first 2,000 uh, years, uh, we have from part of the middle of that 1,000 years and this 1,000 years before the birth of Christ, we've got 40 men writing down and recording what God is given to them. Now, that is over a period of 3,500 years of timeline. And your Bible, there's no way. They were not in the same room. They couldn't talk. They couldn't email each other. They couldn't cell phone each other. The, how in the world could they write and record all of this, never contradict each other, never go against each other, never compromise the essence and the message that's inside. It is God's inerrant, infallible word. And when we do our scholarship, we believe that the preserved word for the English-speaking world is in the 1611 translation to be the scholarship for our children and our grandchildren to not be afraid to trust the inerrant word of God. Now, this process, uh, the Jews quote from the Old Testament, and we know that when Jesus was on planet Earth for those uh, 33 and a half years, and we know the three and a half years of his ministry, we know that Jesus Christ quoted from three-fourths of the 39 books of the Old Testament. You want to have somebody authenticate the Old Testament? What about God's Son? So what about God's Son quoting out of three-fourths of those 39 books. Now, a lot of people, when I'm in the Holy Land, they ask me, where do I think Jesus went from the time of his bar mitzvah there when he uh, was left alone in the temple? Now, you do you remember that? He was in the temple. He came there, and Mildred, he was to celebrate his birthday, and he's 12, and now he's going to be 13 years of age, Okay. And so to, to be a young man, to be 13, he gets his own prayer shawl. And he can now read out of the Torah, right? He's got the privilege as a man to read the Word of God. Well, his mama and daddy get all excited. And they leave with the, with the caravan headed back to Bethlehem. Men usually walk together. The women and the children usually walk together. They stop the camp the first night. And Joseph walks over and says, Mary, how's Jesus doing? And she said, what do you mean? He said, he just had his bar mitzvah. He's with, with the men. He's not with us. I just know how he loves you, Mary. I thought he wanted to walk home with his mama. Well, he's not with me, Joseph. Where's your son? Oh, well, I, I thought he's with his mama. And we've left him. He's in Jerusalem. And, and notice what happened. Where did Jesus live? Where did he eat and sleep? In those three days that Mary and Joseph had to have to get back to him, he stayed at his daddy's house. Amen. Amen. He stayed in the temple. Uh, he ate showbread and, and stayed with, with the rabbis, and he spent the night in his daddy's house. You say, why do you say that? Because over the temple was the Shekinah glory. That's the presence of God. His daddy was home. Every time the Shekinah glory was over the tabernacle or the temple, it meant God's in the house. Yes. Amen? Amen? And so he spent the night there with his father in the temple. Now watch what happened. 
the Bible says that he confused and confounded the scholars and the rabbis with his knowledge of the scriptures. Now, why was he able to do that? The book of John says, and the word became what? Flesh. So what God's saying, if you want to love and respect your Bible, you want to get a new burden to read your Bible and to pray, you, this is Jesus. And the word became flesh. And it became a living book. That's how, that's how I got saved. The living word of God. Amen. And, and Amen. you know why people get mad and uh, I'll preach on TV and I'll talk about morals, faith, and values and I'll get all these ugly letters. I didn't know there was that many people in the travel business. They're all telling me where to go. Uh, but but, but it, it, it's not me. It, they're mad at this. I didn't write this. It's the inerrant, infallible, holy, inspired Word of God. And, uh, Brother Ron, I, I don't know that I can uh, prove this with chapter and verse, but I know one thing at Qumran, where we found the Dead Sea Scrolls, I know that there was a scriptorium there, and when they were polluting the Word of God in Jerusalem, they were selling favors and divorces up in Jerusalem those ultra-conservative Jews, we call them fundamental Baptists, and they left Jerusalem, went down to Qumran, and they brought the scriptures with them and said, it's not for sale. You can't pollute it. You can't change it to fit your sinful lifestyle. And there they meticulously copied the Word of God. And ladies and gentlemen, in 1947, when that shepherd boy threw a rock in there looking for his little sheep, he broke one of the potteries, uh, uh, jars that it was in, and they pulled him out of there, and they had every single book of the Bible but Esther. Every single one were in those caves, buried under that hot sand. And they think the little boy, when he took the first scroll out, he went home to his daddy, and his, all his daddy saw, they couldn't read. Uh, they're better ones. And he thought that he had found some leather. And they said that he cut and made him a pair of sandals, probably out of the book of Esther. Isn't that something? And they found all of it. And, uh, and there in Jerusalem, you, you can go with us and we'll unscroll the book of Isaiah. And it'll read just like your King James Bible. There's only about 33 difference in punctuation and, and, and uh, changes in where the columns begin. But the verbiage, the words, word for word, and that was dug up in 1947. And why did God keep it tucked away? Because he's getting ready to have his nation born in 48, and they had to have something to build on the inerrant, infallible word of God. There's no accident with this God. There's no oops and say, oh, I didn't think of that. God thought of that, and guess what happened? Jesus has his bar mitzvah. He goes then, and he disappears. We don't see him until he's 30 years of age. Now, here's what we do know from Jewish custom. You couldn't be in the army unless you were 20 years old, and you couldn't be a priest unless you were 30 years old. So that's why Jesus had to wait. He would not have been respected. He would not have been listened to. He would not have been qualified to be a rabbi. He had to be 30. So where did he go? From 13, well, we know he went back to Nazareth for a while. But then after the older teen years and the 20s, there's no folklore. There's no stories. If he was in villages doing miracles, there'd be stuff talked about. Well, where did he go? Well, I believe he went to Qumran, and I believe he was there with his best friend. That's where John the Baptist was, and John and Jesus were together, and I believe, this is Ralphology, but I like it. <laughs> I believe he was sitting there in that scriptorium, and he was writing down the book of Isaiah because he already knew it. He had already dictated it once, and I believe the word was preserving the word 
for our generation. I believe those years he spent there with them. And what about Jesus, the living word, looking at the word, writing the word, preserving the word, so that we don't have to be afraid to trust the word Amen. when we hold the Bible today. Amen. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. And all of that, and, and, you know, uh, the, the Essenes, that's where the group of people were. And you have to go back to the New Testament when Jesus was going to be, uh, have his last meal. Where did he request? He didn't request any place in Jerusalem. He said, I want to go to the Essenes, to that quarter. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the conservative Bible believers of that day. And that's where he held the Last Supper. They were so pure, they even had Passover on a different day than the, the uh, show Jews there at the, in Jerusalem. They even had Passover on a separate day. They used a separate calendar because they believed it had been changed. And guess what? According to their calendar, Jesus was crucified on Wednesday. What about that? What about that? Three days and three nights. And, and Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, and then you got Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and they take their times from sundown to sundown. So sometime after sundown, Saturday night, he got out of the grave. What about that? that, that and then that lines up with the book of Jonah, right? As Jonah was three days and three nights, in the belly of the great fish, then the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Well, th then why do we have prayer meeting on Wednesday night? Why don't we have prayer meeting on Tuesday night? Why don't we have prayer meeting on Thursday night? Why do we have church on Sunday? Because every group of Bible believers in the world, we meet every Wednesday, and we are to thank God that His Son gave His life and that He became my sacrifice. He took my place. He died for me. And every Wednesday night, I meet to pray with my brothers and sisters. And I say, God, I thank you that Jesus loved me enough to die for me. And then I run over here. And every Sunday morning, I say, thank God you're alive and well. You got out of the grave and you're coming again. Does that make sense? Every Wednesday, we celebrate the fact that he loved us enough to die for us. And every Sunday morning, we shout the victory because he got out of the grave. Boy, I love this book. Isn't that good stuff? You say, well, Brother Ralph, how do I know the Bible's real? Well, they tell us that the millennials are, are going through a hard time trying to understand what's real, what's not real. They tell us that two out of every ten will never come back into church. And so I want to give you some things to help you defend your faith and so if somebody says to you, I, I talked to two young people last week on two different days. Both of them gave me almost the identical same answer when I mentioned the Word of God. One of them said, well, everybody knows that Adam and Eve and the Noah's Ark stuff is just myth. It's mythology. But I believe God doesn't have a son. I believe he gave his life for our sins. Well, that sounds like Jehudi, isn't it? You take your pen knife, you cut out what you want, and believe what you want to believe. And the other fellow said, I'm trying to process my truth with what's written in that book. Well, I got news for him. He don't have any truth. God's got the truth. God's the final authority. And so that's why we've got to get back to respecting the Bible, respecting the Word. You know, my grandmama wouldn't set a cup of coffee on her Bible. Huh? My daddy wouldn't put a magazine on top of his Bible. He, he just respected the fact that that is the inerrant, infallible Word of God. Huh? And they believe the truth of that Word. Okay, so if you're making notes, how do I know the Bible's the Word of God? This is, this is big right here now. You, you don't want to miss this. This is powerful. You write this down. How do I know the Bible is real how do i know it is the word of god because the bible tells me so <laughs> now i want to tell you where i learned that i i learned that in a song when i was a little guy huh jesus loves me this i know for the tells me what 
so. So how do I know the Bible is the Word of God? Because the Bible says it is the Word of God. And the Bible's always the best commentary upon itself. And it's a reminder. And then how do I know that? Jesus quoted the Old Testament. And that's where I'm going with how I know that. The Bible tells me so. The Word, Jesus Christ, he quoted out of three-fourths of the books of the Old Testament. And uh, by the way, uh, what, if you read the passages in there, uh, Les, what do you find out Jesus is calling the Word of God? He always referred to it as the Scriptures. The Scriptures. There was a respect for the written word. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll, I'll never get to it tonight. I don't have enough time. But let me just help you with something. We had a verbal contract with the Holy God that he'd send his only begotten son and he'd save us. We wouldn't die and go to hell and Jesus would take our place and be an atonement for sin and we'd have life eternal forever and ever. And so I might forget part of the contract and God said, I'll write it out for you. I got a written contract. I might have a bad day. I might have something knock the wind out of me. And I don't even wonder if God's real or whether or not I'm real. And God said, I just read the contract, son. I want you to know it's real when your world's coming apart. You know, Musette was, was uh, uh, in intensive care and she was dying. And I walked out of the hall and I kept praying, God, please don't let her die. Lord, please don't let Musette die. God, please, I need her. The kids need her. The grandbabies need her. God, give us a breakthrough. Give us a miracle. And I'm walking those halls. And then, God, I turned a corner. Got down there by myself in that big old hospital. I saw that Bible laying there. I picked it up. Holy Spirit said, Ralph, I know you love her. I know she's your wife. But she's my child before she's your wife. And I'll do what's best for my children. You don't understand right now. You're looking through an old glass darkly. But I see the whole picture. And I'll do what's best for her. And then I'll leave you the contract. <laughs> Let your faith not melt apart under the stress of the day. Does that make sense? We, we don't belong to each other. We belong to him. And if he asks you to have something you don't want to have, He'll just drive you to the contract. I don't want my mama to die. I don't want my daddy to die. I don't want my best friend to be sick. Think of all the things. But we, if we believe what we say we believe, that's why we've got to go back, Steve. We've got to go back to this book. We've got, to, we've got to get back to the building blocks, get our children back to learning the Word of God, our teenagers back into the Word of God, we, they don't need another light show and another band. They need to know that God's word is alive and well. They're going that that's what they're looking for, something real. Something they can hold on to. Every one of these mass shootings this year have been young people in their 20s because they don't have anything to hold on to. They said today the boy that did a, the shooting there said his body was full of cocaine and, and, and all kinds of self-medications. He, he was trying to find, I preached about it last night, trying to numb reality. That, that's trying to hide it. Church, we are in a tough time in the world. It, but he said, when you see all these things, he said to look up, why? For your redemption draws nigh. It's tough, but don't give up. And, and what's going to hold you that? And Jesus validated this. Uh, and uh, you guys that like to study, what happened when Jesus was tempted? 
if, if we come out of Beth Abera, we're there at the Jordan River, we cross the highway, drive up to eat lunch at Jericho, we get out of the bus and look up, and there's the Mount of Temptation. Jesus encountered the devil three times up on top of that mountain, Matthew 4. And every time he encountered him, he did not answer him with a miracle. He could have performed three miracles, but he didn't do that. You know why? I can't do a miracle. You can't do a miracle. So three times he defeated the devil by quoting him the scripture. He, he, he set that example. He said, this is your victory. And that's why the devil robs you from trying to read it. Isn't it amazing? You can get the Atlanta Journal. It'll weigh 4.7 pounds of newsprint. You can start at the headline and read down to the very end, woman lost puppy dog on Claremont Avenue. Call this number, and you've read the front page to the back page. Pick up your Bible. Open it. And start to read, and you go, oh, Lord, I'm so sleepy. Ah, man. God, you know I love you. I'd read the book, but I'm just dead. You just read seven pounds of newsprint, huh? And just watch Wheel of Fortune. And, and how many times have you watched the same Andy rerun? Huh? And yet we pick up a Bible, and we go brain dead. Uh, you, it might be spiritual warfare. Huh? The devil wants you to be robbed of this time in the Word of God. And Jesus called it the Holy Scripture. And he said in 2 Timothy 3.16, it was inspired by God. And that word inspired, by the way, uh, in the Greek is theonumos. Uh, and I, I, we could spend an hour on this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. As He breathed out of His being came the living Word of God. And the first time He spoke the Word, do you know it's still traveling through space? It hadn't run out of energy. It's still going. It's still out there. It's still alive. And it's God breathed. It's the, your Bible is not the product of men. It's the product of a holy God. And that's what that phrase means if you read it in the Greek New Testament. 2 Peter 1.20, it says, Know this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of private interpretation, of any private interpretation. Now, why did God put 1 Peter 1.20 in the Bible? Because he wanted to say to you, no man had any part of writing this Bible. He wants you to have that. And the prophecy uh, that we have in the Word of God, you, you think about this, holy men of God spake as they were moved on. Think about what he's saying. God spoke, men wrote. It's easy enough. God spoke, men wrote. And, and so... That scripture was given to us. And, and here's what's amazing. If you read the book of Buddha, what you read when you read the book of Buddha, you read uh, sermons by one man, by Buddha. If you read the book of Buddha, it's sermons by one man. If you read the Quran, it's the writings of one man that were compiled after he died. He, he, Muhammad never wrote a Quran, but... After he died, they took all of his writings and they uh, pieced them together and made that book, okay? So Buddha, one man, wrote the sermons of Buddha. The Quran, men put together the sermons of Muhammad and they put them together. But when I pick up my Bible, I've got, those were done at one time at one sitting, book of Buddha and the Quran. They put it together under scholarship and, and they produced it. This book was produced over 1,500 years. 66 different books. 
by 40 different secretaries that were in touch with a triune God. And he breathed into them the word and they recorded it and wrote it down. And a single thread from Genesis to Revelation is woven together that holds it and binds it. See the binding here? Well, what binds it together is the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have the blood in the book of Genesis, and we've got the blood in the book of Revelation, and it is the common thread that weaves it together. You see, it is the Word of God. And what about the prophecies in here? What about Isaiah? What about Micah? Think, think about this. This is going to be the birth of Christ. I'm going to be Isaiah and Micah, 700 years in front of me. 700 years. Not seven days. Not seven weeks. Seven centuries. Seven, no, 700 years. You think about this. And, and what they did, and what did Isaiah do? Isaiah said, when he gets here, the Messiah, he's coming, 700 years. He said, he'll be born of a virgin. And oh, Micah said, amen, buddy. And not only will he be born of a virgin, he'll be born in Bethlehem. <laughs> you can't say that, but Micah could chill that, buddy. You don't know. It's a big country. If he's going to come, the Messiah will be born in Jerusalem. No, he made a declaration, a bold declaration Isaiah said he'll be born of a virgin. Micah said he'll be born in Bethlehem. And David, what about David? David, here it is. And David's writing in Psalms 22. And when he's writing in Psalms 22, here's what you have to think about. If you study, if you do uh, chronologies and you do a secular line, church line, what you discover is in the secular world, 500 years before David is writing and describing a crucifixion. Secular history says the first crucifixion that is in recorded human history is 500 years after Psalms 22. How did David know that there's going to be a cruel punishment and the taking of life that the man would be nailed to a tree and call it a crucifixion 500 years before it happened. Only God Almighty could preserve His Word that you would not be afraid in this dark hour to trust the infallible Word of God that you have in your hand. 500 years before the first crucifixion, David wrote about it. And what about my buddy Daniel? I mean, that's, listen, this is going, it's complicated, but I, I just want to walk you through it. Listen to this carefully. Very important. Daniel writes 500 years before the birth of Christ, okay? He's like David. He's writing 500 years before Christ, the first crucifixion. Daniel now writes 500 years before Jesus is born. Daniel writes in his prophecy that there's going to be a great nation rise up or an empire that will be so powerful that it will dominate the world. And Daniel writes that it is suddenly cut off. That all of a sudden, it's cut off. And it's divided into four empires. And these four empires change and morph into two strong empires that then morph one more time and come back down into one more powerful empire. And then Daniel says, and when the, the giant kingdom's been cut off and it's been divided into four and then it's into two and then it's back into one, then he said, then the Messiah will come. He'll be born on planet Earth. That's pretty bold. Now I want you to remember 500 years before Jesus Christ, world history, secular history, 300 B.C., we have Alexander the Great, one of the greatest uh, conquerors that's ever been. And the Greek Empire dominated the entire known world, the Hellenic Kingdom, the Greek Empire, Alexander the Great. 
300 years B.C. At age 32, Alexander the Great is suddenly cut off. He's killed, 32 years old. What did they do with that great kingdom? Divided it among four generals. Four generals. Those four generals, then later, they become two kingdoms. They become the Ptolemaic kingdom and the Seleucid kingdom. And those four generals then come into these two kingdoms. And these two kingdoms then become the great what? Roman Empire. Alexander the Great dies, suddenly cut off. Daniel nailed it. Divided into four. Four generals take over. Daniel nailed it. Then it come, becomes two kingdoms out of those four. Daniel nailed it. And then he said the two will become one that will be the greatest kingdom of all, the Roman Empire. Daniel nailed it. And then while, Acts, while we're reading Luke 2, it says when Caesar Augustus, that's a Roman ruler, he said that there's going to be a census and everybody had to go give an account and Mary and Joseph leave Nazareth and go to Bethlehem and Jesus Christ is born in Bethlehem and Daniel nailed it because the Roman Empire's there and we got a Caesar sitting on the throne the day that Jesus Christ is born. Your Bible is the inerrant infallible word of God and to this day historians are amazed with this pinpoint prediction of Daniel 500 years before Christ 200 years before Alexander the Great it was even uh, made a, a great conquering hero Daniel talked about Alexander the Great and he even talked about his sudden death and he even knew about the four generals that's unreal that's unheard of but it is the Bible, it is the Word of God. And that's what you've got to take home with you tonight when you hold on to your Bible. Now, I don't have time to finish this. It's too fascinating, and, 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 and you're too tired. But I want to tell you something. You get a new hunger for your Bible, and you begin to read the Bible, and you put that with what we talked about last night, start praying again, and when we begin to pray again and we begin to read and study our Bible again, then God will begin to give you personal revival. Then he'll give you home revival. Then he'll give you church revival. Then we can start saying, bless God, let's bring that old tent to town and let's have all these churches come together and let's see an area-wide meeting. But you've got to do the homework. God doesn't force feed it. He, he's not going to take one of you out there in the parking lot and tie you to the bumper of your truck and say, I want you to have revival. You've got to want it. You've got to be desperate. Yes, sir. What are we missing off the church? Desperation. We have substituted our... Do we worry about whether or not God's going to meet with us on Sunday? Or do we get here worried about where we're going to eat lunch? Uh, now, uh, I'm, not, I'm not throwing any rocks. I like fried chicken just as much as anybody else. But I'm serious. Do we get in the building and are we praying before we get here? God, this might be the day. God, this might be the day you'd send revival to our church. Or God, you might call one of our young men to preach. Or God, you might save one of our young daughters that's been tricked by the lies of the devil and she thinks she wants to be like Hollywood. Or she's got them little earbuds and she's listening to all that music. She's only 14 years old and it's nothing but liquid pornography. It's all filled with vulgarity, profanity, and obscenity. I can't even preach on it in public anymore because every rock song is built around this rap and hip-hop music around the very bottom of the debased debauchery of a depraved being. And your little girls are feeding off that. Your little boys are feeding off that. And they're hearing it. And then they'll look at you and they'll pull one out and let you yell at them, and, and then they go right back and say they do what they want to do. Huh? Why? Because the message of that music is rebel against God, number one, rebel against your parents, number two, and rebel against authority. And that's why you had six policemen shot last night in Philadelphia 
And while they're going in to get them out of the gunfire, you got people throwing bottles at them and cursing them and swearing them at them while they're actually bleeding to protect them because they represent authority. And nobody's going to tell me what to do. I know that's not a popular message, but that's why you've got to get back in that book. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I saw something in Korea I'll never forget. I told them last night about some of the prayer stuff. But you talk about being desperate. Brother Billy Kim said, Ralph, he said, the people are responding. I, I, I'm just telling you, it's unbelievable how the people were coming to the special meeting. He said, I'm going to get on the radio and tell them that between, I'd already done three services on Sunday morning. He said, I'm going to tell them you'll be here at 3 o'clock at the radio station. At the radio station. And he said, you, you preach again. And he just got on the radio on the spur of the moment. said, Ralph is going to preach at 3 o'clock at the radio station, downtown Seoul, Sunday afternoon. Over 1,000 people came to the radio station. And they're in the hallways. They're in the little meeting room. And they're, they're praying and they're singing. They, they got an auditorium there. And they're in there begging God. And you know what I saw? Listen to this. I saw a woman come through the door and she's got her son on her back. She's so desperate, he's crippled. And he's, she's bent over like this, carrying her boy. The boy's bigger than her. She probably weighed 92 pounds. And she's carrying that boy. He's crippled. He can't talk. He can't move his limbs. And she backs up and puts him in a chair. And we're all singing. We're praising the Lord. And, and she's so desperate for God to do something for her. God, if you could heal my boy. God, if you could get through and save my boy. But she's so desperate. She carried that boy on her back to hear preaching. If anybody could have missed church Sunday, she could have missed church. She was tired. She has to clean him like an infant. She has to wash his clothes. She has to feed him and mash the food up. And she gets that boy on her back and carries him to hear the preached word of God. And then this is when I lost it. We got to singing and folks got, they were singing about victory in Jesus. And they got to raising their hands and crying. And she got up and went behind him. And, and, and when she got behind him, you know what she did? She got a hold of his arms. And she held up his arms. And she said, praise the Lord, son. Praise the Lord. He can't raise his arm, but she wanted. And she got behind him and held up his arms so he could praise God. Huh? I felt like I was about that tall with that desperation for her son to see God. I got to leave. They took me out of one room and into another room. I prayed with them, and all of a sudden, the interpreter turned around, and he said, Brother Ralph, stop. Brother Ralph, stop. And when I turned around, somebody grabbed my legs, and I looked down, and that woman is on my legs, and she's kissing my feet. And she, and I said, what's she saying? What's she saying? She's saying, ask the man of God if he'll pray for my boy. Ask the man of God if he'll pray for my boy. Ask the man of God if he'll pray for my boy. She said, we don't have any hope but God. There's no hope but God. What if we got desperate for our children? What if we got desperate for our kids to see God? We've got to get in the Word. We've got to know what we believe and why we believe it. We've got to pray again. But out of that reading and praying, we're going to get desperate. You know, I reached down and I got her up and I said, You tell her there's nothing special about me. I'm just an old sinner that got saved. I said, But we will pray. But I said, The one that can help her is God Almighty and His Son, Jesus Christ. I, I love you. It's one of my favorite places to be is in this part of Georgia. So many friends. I don't want us to lose our heritage. 
I told the men at lunch today, I, I, I can't quote it because it's so ugly, but you, you ought to just read what Tommy Lee of Motley Crue said about the Bible Belt, about you people, about me. I'm in the Bible Belt. We're despised. Let me tell you something. There's been a move by the media to connect us to the president. When I say that, the Bible believer. And that is so that if he loses, the persecution of the church can begin. Now you mark my words. That animosity and that hatred for that Bible, the Word of God, the, that protect that they've gone out of their way to the, the shootings. We're we're responsible for that. We're the deplorables. And you you watch what happens in this country if that bumper's taken away, then you watch how all this is going to flip. Franklin Graham, right before the election, his his ministry. And the uh, Samaritan's Purse, they were audited nine times by the IRS right before that. And people don't realize how the government had been weaponized against the Christian movement, against churches. And, and God just stepped in. It, it shouldn't have happened. And God just stepped in and said, wait a minute. I'm going to give you a chance to get right. I'm going to give you a little window here. Will you get desperate for my word again? Will you read again? Will somebody get your babies? <laughs> And say, I'm going to carry them into church. You, 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 you may have to do it in your mind, but God knows where they are, and God will go get them. But you're going to bring that burden of prayer, that agony, that travail to the house of God. Let's open the altar, and how about the instruments playing for me? Pass me not, O gentle Savior, hear my humble cry. And if you could want to come and pray for your family, your friends, you just do that. If you're not able to kneel, you might want to come and sit on one of these front benches. Let's stand together. And uh, I've got a lot more on this thing on the Scriptures, but let's, let's just stop here tonight. We'll have a time of prayer together, close out this, this time in the Word. And if you want to come and pray, you just step out and come right on. If my people, which are called by my name, shall do what? Humble themselves. Hardest thing for us to do is to be humble. Sunday school teachers, bring your class to the altar. Preachers, bring your sheep. Hey, mama, bring your babies. Grandparents, bring your children, grandchildren. Don't, don't miss the Lord tonight. You say, I'm not a member here. Well, we're not talking about a church building. We're talking about the body of Christ. You can't kneel, you come and sit here. We're going to go through a verse. Don't let Jesus pass you by. Page 373 down at the bottom. Pass me or not. Father, we thank you for the word, the power of your word. I pray you'd save the lost, reclaim the backslider, then God, you'd charge the church 
give us a new burden, a new vision. And God, do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Hear the prayer and the petition for our children, our grandchildren. And then, God, as Christians have prayed, give God a new burden for your word and a new vigor to pray. And, God, we ask one more time, would you spare America, send revival, and we'll give you praise in Christ's name. Amen and amen. You can be seated while these are still praying. No one's going to rush them. I just want to thank you, Pond Fork, for letting me come. And uh, so many friends from other churches, I appreciate you so very much. And thank you for being here. And uh, a lot of you have a burden and a concern. And uh, I appreciate each and every one of you. And Brother Les Fuller, I appreciate you coming from Dahlonega. And Brother Steve Barrett, I appreciate you from Murrayville coming and being with us. These men are praying for revival in that part of Georgia, maybe about putting a tent up in the future. So let's just keep praying together. Would you love to see God do it one more time? Amen. Ladies, if you can help the families over in Israel, there's no charge for these. It's just a donation. There's a white envelope back there, and you just put your donation in it, and you give it. Y'all ladies, come on back there and be getting ready to help them. And uh, if you want the, uh, any of the prophecy videos, they're back there. How, do any of you in this area get prophecy in the news uh, television program out of Oklahoma City, JR Church, on your cable system? Okay. All right, I'm flying out to Oklahoma City. I'll be doing a a thing for him in California, Oklahoma, on prophecy, uh, prophecy in the news. So you be praying for us. That'll be in September. So uh, thank you for the privilege of being with us, uh, to being together tonight. And uh, we got the information about uh, these Bible study uh, tours to, to uh, get in the Word together. Pastor, you come close to service. Thank you again for the invitation. I love you all very much.